How shall we relate to these times? How shall we relate to these times? This is the theme of our series of meetings today. And it's very interesting, brethren and sisters, if you've been watching the news and watching the events that are taking place, that we are certainly in a new era, certainly from the beginning of this year, certainly from the outset of COVID-19, we have entered into another threshold of human existence, whereby, as we said back in June, when we had our first series of meetings, there's no turning back to what we were before the outset of this crisis. Uh, this is a very interesting title that came up on the website of the Australian newspaper. It says, eight months after the coronavirus burst out of Wuhan, the world is entering, notice, a transformative era. Prepare for more chaos, destruction, and instability. Now, this is what the world is saying. And back in June, I recall that I read something from ABC News from the Department of Defense here in Australia, where they envisage greater troubles ahead of us. And they said, should at any time international trade be cut off from this nation totally, completely, it will only take three months until our whole society disintegrates into utter chaos and anarchy. People out there in the world recognize, brethren and sisters, that we are living in very troublous times. The Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison mentioned that Australia needs to prepare for a post-COVID world that is, quoting his words, poorer, more dangerous, and more disorderly. There is no coming back to a previous time of peace and security like we once enjoyed. And especially if you've been watching what's been happening in the United States, the unprecedented amount of violence and rioting and looting in certain sections of America, particularly Portland, Oregon, and we're going to focus on that a little bit during the course of this first presentation. There's a reason why these things are allowed to de develop and unfold and to continue as they have been for all these weeks. Quoting from this particular website, Briar Bart, Rioters in Portland, Oregon have expressed their hopes of tearing down the system, the current American system, and ultimately building a new one based on extreme socialist ideologies. Many express their aim to encourage a societal breakdown and a radical reformation. And as we said last June, this current crisis, in whatever way it has arisen, deliberate or otherwise, is being exploited by other forces for ulterior purposes to pursue a particular agenda. And this has been effectively seen right across the world. So today we are going to cover in our first presentation the war against Western civilization. You could also phrase that as the war against biblical Christianity. It has always been that war, has always been waged down through the centuries of time, but it is intensifying, as we know, up to the climax of the great Sunday law issue. And you can also say that this is a war against Protestant values and Protestant principles against Protestantism itself. It's amazing, uh, in light of what is happening today, that people of the world, there are those in the world whose eyes are starting to awaken to the seriousness of the times in which we live. It's sort of they've been awakened from their dream, from their sleep, and they're starting to inquire, what do these things mean? I found this particular uh, report here from the Jerusalem Post in Israel, which says an amazing 44% of Americans polled said that they see the global coronavirus pandemic and economic meltdown as a wake-up call for us to turn back to God, to faith in God, as signs of coming judgment. Nearly three in 10 Americans, 29% polled, said they believe that the coronavirus and economic meltdown are signs that we are living in what the Bible calls the last days. 
So brethren and sisters, we as Seventh-day Adventists are uniquely positioned for such a time as this to give the message that they need about the imminence of Christ's second coming and of the three angels' messages and to unmask the agenda that is going on behind the scenes with the three unholy spirits confederating together to bring the world to a point of decision time to serve Christ or to serve Antichrist. People are now starting to inquire and to search for what these things mean. And it's interesting as a reaction to the riots and the looting and the Marxist uh, theology that is coming forth, that there's a reaction now from the churches, from Christian groups in America particularly, but it will be more manifested across the world. Evangelist Franklin Graham has called on thousands of families, pastors, and churches to join him for Prayer March 2020 in Washington, D.C. on September 26, 2020. He said, quote, America is in trouble. It is in distress, but we do have hope, and that hope is in Almighty God, and we need to pray now more than ever. We can expect to hear more of these appeals for America to come back to God exactly as it has been written in the book, The Great Controversy. Now, I encourage all of us to reread again and restudy that book. It is a book for our time to prepare us for the coming conflict. In letter 102, 1886, Alan White wrote these words. Every year, the swellings of wrath, tumults, and fierce riots are increasing. The signs of the times tell us we are surely in the last days. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. We can see these perils more distinctly. Things are rapidly developing. All are ranging under their respective banners. All are preparing for some great event. All are watching for the morning. One class is watching and waiting for their Lord, while the other class is waiting for what Lucifer may perform of his wonder-working power. Kingdoms are in uncertainty, one watching jealously the other. Soldiers are being drilled constantly, preparing for war. There is a rending apart of kingdoms, the stone cut out of the mountain, it should say singular, without hands, is about to smite the image upon the feet. That was 1886, brethren and sisters, and these words are so timely in the year 2020. And we ought to remember in the wider sphere of things that this is not just a physical contest, a political battle. It is a spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is what we're contending with, brethren and sisters, in all the forces that are at play in the world and in the church, there is an undercurrent, there is another spirit warring against God's truth. And the decision for us is, on whose side shall we align ourselves with? This is all part, as we know, of the great controversy battle that began way in, back in heaven, as recorded in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. That's the origin of the warfare, of the contest between truth and error, between Christ and Satan. And we're coming to the tail end of this controversy, this side of the coming of Christ. We ought to remember with the things that are happening in this world, though place, time, and circumstances may vary slightly and people come and go, the same pattern of behavior is repeating itself down through the centuries of time in this contest between truth and error. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. As the old saying goes, history repeats itself. 
and those who do not learn from the lessons of the past are bound to repeat the same thing today. The war initiated by Lucifer in heaven and ultimately he became Satan, the adversary, is always and has been against the law of God. And this is what is in play now, has always been, and will climax in the great Sunday law issue. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 337. Satan's enmity against God's law has impelled him to war against, notice, every precept of the Decalogue. Every single one of the Ten Commandments, Satan has declared war against those principles. Great Controversy 568, 1888 edition. It is Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God. The nature of sin, we've dealt with that in past presentations, that is so crucial, especially in Adventism, and the real issues at stake in the great controversy. His sophistry lessens the obligation of the divine law and gives men license to sin. Have we heard this theology before? The sin and live theology, the new theology, if you want to call it, is the same thing. It lessens the obligation of the person to keep God's law by his power and grace. Thus, the minds of men are blinded and Satan secures them as his agents to war against God. As Jesus said, those who are not for me are against me. And by our attitude and response to the issues of the great controversy, we declare who is our leader. Great Controversy 326, this is from the 1884 edition. Hatred of the pure principles of truth and reproach and persecution of its advocates will exist as long as sin and sinners remain. The followers of Christ and the servants of Satan cannot harmonize. The offense of the cross has not ceased. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It cannot, cannot be agreement between the two sides, between those who follow Christ and those who reject him. In letter 103, 1894, something that was written to A.T. Jones, Ellen White said these words, opposition to the truth is not limited to any age or any country. Those who have the truth, who uphold the principles of truth found in the word of God, are the objects of Satan's wrath and enmity. He will stir up the minds of the disobedient and rebellious, and all apostates will unite, notice, in a firm and desperate companionship against the law of God to war against the government of God. Satan has thousands of satanic battles to open upon the soldiers of Jesus Christ. What a profound statement that is. That shows the ingenuity, the intellect of Satan that has been prostituted, of course, to further evil, but his mental capacity to wage thousands of satanic battles upon the soldiers of Christ at the one time. For what purpose? To get us to unite with him in a firm and desperate companionship against his God's law and against the government of God. And this has been played out on the streets of the cities of America and across the world and in the churches and yes, even within our denomination for the very same purpose to get people to go away from their allegiance to God's government and to his law, his constitution, if you please, the transcript of his character. This epitomizes the powerful words of this text. It's a memory verse for us as Seventh-day Adventists, Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant, the last of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That tells us, brethren and sisters, that God's people at the very end of time 
will be those who keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which we know in Revelation 19.10 is the spirit of prophecy. But why are we as Seventh-day Adventists on the whole not fully awake to the significance of the times in which we live? Great Controversy 327, 1884 edition. Why are the soldiers of Christ so sleepy and indifferent? Because they do not realize their peril. There is but little enmity against Satan and his works because there is so great ignorance concerning his power and malice and the vast extent of his warfare against Christ and his church. Multitudes are deluded here. Oh, brethren and sisters, this is not a time to be sleeping at our posts. This is not a time to be indifferent to the signs of the times that are taking place about us. This is not a time to be ignorant of the workings of the enemy against God and his people. We're told in the same book, 335, so long as we are ignorant of their wiles, that's the wiles of evil spirits, they have almost inconceivable advantage. And many give heed to their suggestions while they suppose themselves to be following the dictates of their own wisdom. Brethren and sisters, if we don't have the mind of Christ, if we're not illuminated by the Holy Spirit, if our feet are not grounded upon the solid rock of eternal truth, we will give heed to, to the suggestions of the enemy thinking they come from our own mind. They're really the thoughts implanted by the enemy. And if we are ignorant of his wiles, Satan and his hosts have an almost inconceivable advantage over us. We can't afford to be in that position. The same book 335 says, there is nothing that the great deceiver fears so much as that we shall become acquainted with his devices. We're not called upon by God to be experts, to be so knowledgeable in the nefarious affairs of the enemy, but we are to become acquainted with what he's doing so we can be aware to warn people and for ourselves not to fall into his traps. We must always remember, brothers and sisters, we're not fighting alone. God is fighting for us and with us so long as we are united with him. Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. The captain of the hosts of heaven has never lost a battle. Everything is under his control, brethren and sisters. We have nothing to fear for the future, as we've been told, except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 20, the second part says, Our God shall fight for us. Praise God. We're not alone, brethren and sisters. All of God, uh, God and his holy angels, who outnumber Satan's angels, by the way, are fighting with us so long as we're on, his, on their side. Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 4 says, For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Let us claim these promises, brethren and sisters. Let us not be fearful nor be discouraged, but have hope. Look up and lift up our heads for our redemption. Joroth 9. Second Chronicles chapter 20 verse 15, the second part says, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Manuscript 69, 1896. The law of God is being trampled underfoot. That's what we're seeing today. That's what we'll see ultimately in the very near future. The blood of the covenant is being despised. And can we fold our hands? and say we have nothing to do let us arouse the battle is raging 
Truth and error are nearing their final conflict. Let us march under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel and fight the good fight of faith and win eternal honors for the truth will triumph and we may be more than conquerors through him who loved us. Oh, praise God for these wonderful words of encouragement. Let us be awake. Let us be alert. Let us be aware. Let us not faint, nor give up. Not now. Not as we're so close to the borders of eternity. We can almost see, as it were, the heavenly Canaan just across the horizon. Let us fight the good fight of faith with strength from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The war against Western civilization, which was built on Judeo-Christian principles, is being waged on three fronts. One, the war fought by atheism. You can classify that under different categories, Marxism, evolution, humanism, and so forth. Number two, the war has been fought by apostate Christianity, ecumenism, infiltration, and so forth. And number three, the war being fought by spiritualism, occultism, secret societies, and the like. These three unholy spirits, Roman Catholicism, apostate Protestantism, and spiritualism, uniting together to wage war against God's eternal truth. We need to be aware of these devices. And we need to also recognize that the war against truth is most effectively being fought and decidedly fought in the classrooms of the schools of the world, both out there in the secular world and also in religious institutions. And Adventism is not exempt. What are the objectives of Christ-centered education? What is the purpose of God's true educational plan? Let me just read you a couple of statements for the sake of time. In the book, Education, a most powerful classic work on the subject of the whole theme of education, pages 15 and 16, it is to restore in man the image of his maker. Another word for image in this context is character. To restore in man the character of his maker. This was to be the object of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. And as a process of restoring that character of God in our lives, this is another principle of true education. Same book, page 17. It is the work of true education to develop this power, to train the youth to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. Yes, brethren and sisters, God wants us to use this brain power to be able to reason from cause to effect that under the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit, we can discern the difference between truth and error. We're not to be like sponges absorbing anything and everything that this world has to throw upon us. We ought to decipher that frontal lobe ought to be clear to be able to think to its full capacity by God's grace to be able to be thinkers and not just parroters of what other people say. We know the world is creating a mind of conformity that everybody must conform to this one mindset and not think, not reason, not work things through as far as the great issues are concerned today with the loss of personal freedoms and the, the downgrading of our religious liberties and so forth. We're not supposed to critique, we're not supposed to analyze these things. We're not supposed to think as to where they originate from and where they are tending. This has all been part of a process in the public school system to weld the students into a new social mind. Way back in 1933, this man, Harold Ruggs, said these words, a new public mind is to be created. How? Only by creating tens of millions of new individual minds and welding them into a new 
social mind. Old stereotypes must be broken up and new climates of opinion formed in the neighborhoods of America. Brethren and sisters, it's part of a process of this new one world government that they're proposing to institute. It must require a new social mindset that will conform to the dictates of this order. And this has been in plan for decades. As we see here from another quote from the 1930s, this is almost 90 years ago. In this book, The Dare to School, Build a New Social Order, George Counts wrote, the teachers should reach for power and make the most of their conquest to the extent that they're allowed to fashion the curriculum of the school, they will definitely and positively influence the social attitudes, ideals, and behavior of the coming generation. That's how much power a teacher has at his disposal to mold and fashion the minds of his students. Now, if he does it for the power of good, by the power of God's grace, it can work a wonderful transformation in the heart of the students. But if it's used for evil, oh, brethren and sisters, the effects of that we are seeing in our world today. How are the changes in the ideals of a nation brought about? Simply by changing what is taught in the schools and colleges and universities and in the churches and also in the mass media. And I've put this old television set there to illustrate that this has been happening for decades, even in the black and white days of television. To accomplish the former goal, the new authorities in education had most of the basic textbooks scrapped or rewritten to plug the new socialist line. Many new textbooks made their appearance in classrooms, all specifically designed to undermine traditional values and to brainwash the students into the acceptance notice of socialism in which big brother government would influence or control virtually every phase of people's lives. We are seeing this today, aren't we, with the current coronavirus pandemic, especially here in the state of Victoria, with the current lockdowns, restrictions, and curfews. Big brother government is now virtually controlling every phase of our living existence, and there is, on the whole, total, complicit acceptance of what is taking place. This has all been brought about through the educational system. At first, there were loud protests from those alert enough to realize that something was drastically wrong. The progressive educators changed their tactics. Their attacks on the nation's heroes, customs, and heritage were changed from being open to being plied and were thus much harder to detect by those who were not analyzing and weighing every word from being nation building institutions, foundational pillars in a basically sound society, the school and college systems were transformed into what has rightly been termed incubators of degeneracy. Very powerful words taken from the book, The Fourth Reich of the Rich, pages 1881 by Des Griffin. This reminds me of the words of Martin Luther, which are also quoted in Great Controversy, that if the word of God and the principles of the Bible are not inculcated in the schools where our students are attending, those institutions would become corrupt. Brethren and sisters, the reformers understood the principles of true education, which their successors lost sight of down through the years, and the papal form of education took its place. In the Washington Times, it has come to the point, as reported here on November 4th, 2017, a survey was taken of students across the United States, and it revealed that 58% of the students polled would prefer to live in a socialist, communist, or fascist nation than a capitalistic one. Yes, brethren and sisters, the educational process for Marxists socialist theology has taken such a, such a root in our educational systems, not just in America, Australia as well, in the Western world, that students would prefer to live in a socialist communist country. Can you believe it? 
And the irony of that is that they think that way and want that way whilst they're living in a free society. If they were to be transplanted to China, I'm sure they will see the reality of what the system really is like. And this is something that the communists and the Marxists know so well that it is in the classroom that the minds must be molded to fit according to their agenda. In the book, The Naked Communist, page 314, published in 1962, it is in the schools that the foundations for a communist outlook are laid. And no one should be allowed in the slightest deviation from the principles of the communist materialistic upbringing of the new generation. Satan knows, brethren and sisters, that to influence the next generation, he must target the schools. And as we said back in June, the underlying premise of communism is Marxism. And the foundation of Marxism is anti-Christian, anti-religion, anti-faith, anti-liberty, anti-privacy, anti-respect to human dignity. It is robbing the person of their God-given rights privileges. And Marxism is relentlessly hostile to religion. That's why we have such a secular society in Australia, and particularly because the principles of Marxism have been so successfully inculcated in the educational institutions, and of course, propagated through the media and through the press and through all the things that are taking place around the world, that biblical Christianity is now considered to be on the fringes, whereas once upon a time, it was the central tenant of our civilization, Western civilization. 19th century Russian journalist and essayist, Fyodor Doitevsky said this, if there is no God, then everything is permitted. Do we see why? sin and vice and crime is proliferating in our world today when the principles of God's word is not inculcated and embedded in the heart, sin reigns and thrives and destroys. Another communist from America many decades ago, William Foster said this, with the communists, the end justifies the means. Why is it that the rioters in America are doing what they're doing? They believe that their tactics, their efforts to try to dismantle the system justifies the means, the accomplishment of their goals. Whether his tactics be legal or moral or not does not concern him, so long as they are effective. What happens to moral absolutes? They're dismantled in this system of false education. Remember, true education is to restore the character of God in us. False education does the opposite. It is to eradicate the character of God in humanity. But what takes its place? It is the character of the enemy. Vladimir Lenin said this, this is moral relativism at its classic best. To lie, is that wrong? Not for a good cause. To steal, is that wrong? Not for a good cause. To kill, is that wrong? Not for a good cause. The end justifies the means. Brethren and sisters, it's not for nothing and in the book, The Great Controversy, pages 232, 233, that's the 1911 edition, Ellen White speaks of the Jesuits who operate under this same principle. The end justifies the means. And she said there was nothing too base, too low for the Jesuits to do in order to accomplish their goals. It's the same principle because it's the same principle of the Jesuits that has infiltrated, that has actually fermented this Marxist communist agitation upon the world as part of the broader agenda to bring humanity into conformity with the principles of the coming one world movement. You know, what Lenin said reminds me of um, an allegory 
that George Orwell wrote way back in, I think, in the 1940s, Animal Farm. Some of you may re recall the story of the animals who caused a riot there on Farmer Jones's property. They felt they were exploited and they evicted Farmer Jones from his land and they were now going to manage a worker's paradise on the farm. The pigs were elected to be the leaders of this revolution and all the animals in this allegory came together and wrote out certain principles on the back of the farm by which they thought they were going to operate. The principles they came up with were as follows. No animal shall sleep in a bed. No animal shall drink alcoholic liquors. No animal shall kill another animal. All animals are equal. All sounded very fine, theoretically. But as the animals were living their lives on the farm, nobody could fix the windmill when it broke. Nobody could repair the buildings when it fell down. And the lot of the animals got harder, except for the pigs who enjoyed all the luxuries of Farmer Jones's property. And when the animals protested, some of them were killed. And the allegory goes that the animals came back to the farm to see what was wrong with the principles, what they could find that could point out to the leaders why things were not working the way they should. And they noticed that some extra words were added to these principles. No animal shall sleep in a bed with sheets. No animal shall drink alcoholic liquors to excess. No animal shall kill another animal without cause. And then the greatest principle of all, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. What George Orwell was parroting here was the inherent unfairness and relativism of Marxist, communist, socialist theology. Brethren, sisters, this is how Satan operates. One law for me, one law for everybody else. I do whatever I want, you can't do whatever you want to me because the end justifies the means. This is what's being played out on the streets of America at this time and it's going to sweep all around the world. All the various forms of socialism would it be communist socialism, national socialism like Hitler did? All these forms of socialism drive a dagger through the veritable, irreversible principles of the Bible when they declare the only absolute truth is that there are no absolute truths. That's an oxymoron in itself. If there are no absolute truths, how can there be an absolute truth that there are no absolute truths? It's, that's, this is human fo folly being masqueraded as wisdom. There are no eternal facts as there are no absolute truths. Moral relativism, this is what's been taught in the educational institutions and this is why the morality of society has collapsed. And when people publicly stand for the principles of the Bible, for what the Bible teaches and certainly what the Lord God declares, they are mocked, they're ridiculed, they're ostracized and they're driven from the public platform of human debate in society. Joseph Stalin said these words, sincere diplomacy is no more possible than dry water or iron wood. The truth doesn't matter. It's what we can make out of a situation, regardless how bad it is, the end justifies the means. It's interesting, brethren and sisters, as we will see more and more as we come to the end of time, that the basis for every principle, every theology, every teaching that is not based on God's word, the basis for Marxism, communism, radical socialism in this instance is hate. Brethren and sisters, we know Jesus said in John 14, 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. If we hate God, we will not keep his commandments. And the basis of this anti-God philosophy, this satanic philosophy, is hate. Lenin himself said, we must hate. Hatred is the basis for communism. Children must be taught to hate their parents if they are not communists. And that was taught in the school system of the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe for seven decades. 
certainly in the Soviet Union, for seven decades, hatred is the basis for communism and that children must hate their parents if they don't go, go along with the system. Another man by the name of Anatole Valeselovich Lunakarsky, if I'm pronouncing it right, a Russian commissar for education a hundred years ago. This is what he said. We hate Christians and Christianity. Even the best of them must be considered our worst enemies. Imagine that, the mindset. What power is possessing a mind to say such words? They preach love of one's neighbor and mercy, which is contrary to our principles. Christian love is an obstacle to the development of the revolution. Down with love of our neighbor. What we want is hate. Only then can we conquer the universe. You're hearing the words of Lucifer, Satan himself, with these expressions. He hates God so much, he believes with this hatred that he has, he can win over God in this great controversy battle. It is utter stupidity and foolishness, for he is a lost being. He has lost the battle, but he is instilling this spirit of hatred in the hearts of his disciples. And in the Lesser Soviet Encyclopedia, volume 11, page 1045, the teaching of hatred toward the enemies of the toilers enriches the concept of socialist humanism by distinguishing it from sugary and hypocritical philanthropy. So we see, brethren and sisters, this anti-God system is based on hatred. And we're seeing this exhibited, unfortunately, on the streets of America today. Vladimir Lenin said, riots, demonstrations, street battles, detachments of a revolutionary army, such are the stages in the development of the popular uprising. These things are planned. These things are deliberate. Fox News, August the 10th, 2020, reported that U.S. Attorney General Bill Barr stated that the United States is facing a new form of urban guerrilla warfare by the radical left. This is a deliberate strategy to try to undermine society in North America at this time. Looks like someone's playing games on our screen here, but we will pursue and pray that God will intervene. End of the American Dream, August the 11th, 2020, stated that the United States might be entering a new era of permanent civil unrest and that the worst is still to come. And this is what we're seeing on the streets of Portland and there are other places in Chicago as well. The rioting, the looting, the shooting, the killing, it is incredible what has taken place just within the last few months in the United States. But this is not spontaneous. This is all deliberate. This is all planned. This is all calculated with a deliberate strategy to try to bring about a certain effect upon society. Notice this picture, which was just taken a few days ago. Notice this makeshift guillotine. It's not a real one, but that picture tells a thousand words. Do you remember a time in history when the guillotines were in active use? Does that remind you of the French Revolution? What about this incident that occurred earlier this month of Bibles being burnt there outside the federal courthouse in Portland, Oregon? These are scenes and depictions that are reminiscent of the French Revolution, the same spirit that spurred on the revolution and the anti-God spirit of that particular incident in human history is being witnessed and exemplified on the streets of America at this time. This isn't an evolutionary battle, but a revolutionary one. It doesn't draw on tradition of constitutionalism, but on Marxism. Its model isn't the American Revolution, but what? The French Revolution, hence the purges. In other words, if you don't support this movement, Black Lives Matter, you're fired. You're deemed to be a racist. 
Brethren and sisters, we know that every life matters. Every life is precious. And we affirm that all black lives matter, just as all Latino lives matter, and all people matter, because all are purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. But this movement is not about racial equality. It is political for a particular purpose. History is repeating itself. The atheistical power that ruled in France during the revolution and the reign of terror did wage such a war against God and his holy word as the world had never witnessed. Jesus Christ was declared to be an imposter and the rallying cry of the French infidels was crush the wretch, meaning Christ. This is what communism, Marxism is. This is what every anti-God philosophy and religion in the world is. It hates God. It hates his law. It hates his government. It hates his people who want to follow Christ out of love. See that picture of the man treading on the head that's supposed to represent Christ, the total destruction of Christianity. Bibles were collected and publicly burned with every manifestation of scorn during the French Revolution. The law of God was trampled underfoot. The institutions of the Bible were abolished. All religious worship was prohibited except that of liberty and the country. Yes, their liberty is based upon freedom from God's law, which we know is bondage. Maximilian Robespierre, one of the leaders of the French Revolution during the reign of terror, which was around 1793, he declared, quote, terror is nothing else than justice, prompt, severe, inflexible. The government in a revolution is liberty's despotism against tyranny. In other words, the end justifies the means. And Jesus says, what you do to somebody else will come back to you. He was one of the leaders who executed those who were declared to be unloyal, disloyal to the new revolution. He himself was executed by others who thought him to be disloyal to the revolution. What goes around comes around. And what has happened in the past, Solomon says, will be repeated again. There is no new thing under the sun. Great Controversy 401, 1884 edition. It was then demonstrated to the world that to throw off the restraints which God has imposed is to accept the rule of the cruelest of tyrants. There's a place in the Spirit of Prophecy, I can't recall the reference now, where it spoke of the mild rule of Jesus. And his rule is mild because it's based on love. But Satan's rule is based on hatred, and it's cruel, and it's vindictive. And humanity, when given under the control of his spirit, acts out the same way, just like it did during the destruction of, Jer of Jerusalem, as outlined in the first chapter of the book, The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy, page 273, 1911 edition, the same master spirit that urged on the St. Bartholomew's massacre led also in the scenes of the revolution. What a dreadful incident that was. August the 24th, 1572, 70,000 Protestants massacred in one or two nights, I believe. The same bloodthirsty urge that was propelling those people to execute such dastardly crimes led in the scenes of the revolution and is possessing the minds of those who reject God's principles. Patrice Cullors, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, she said, she admitted five years ago, we are trained Marxists. We are super versed on sort of ideological theories. This is no novice movement that has come on the scene that has made its presence felt around the world. Patrice Cullors said that the Labour Community Strategy Center, which she initially joined, was her first political home. The center states, quote, we appreciate the work of the US Communist Party. And the US Communist Party 
as with all branches of communism, thrives on conflict and war. This particular man was once a communist. He left the Communist Party after he discovered the real objectives of communism for the black people in America. And this is what he said way back in 1935. Black rebellion was what Moscow wanted. Bloody racial conflict would split America. America's about to be split now with what's taking place. During the confusion, demoralization and panic would set in. This has been played before our very eyes, brethren and sisters, and we need to appreciate these devices that Satan is implementing on the world stage. Leonard Patterson was another ex-communist, and this is what he said in 1965. I broke away from the party, the Communist Party, when it became clear to me what the communists were really up to. It was to use the Negro people in this country as cannon fodder in a violent and bloody revolution aimed at establishing an American Soviet dictatorship. When I was studying communist strategy and tactics in Moscow, my instructors emphasized the importance of using honest grievances and popular slogans as a smokescreen to cover up the true nature of the revolution. We were taught how to use propaganda and arouse the emotions of the masses. We learn how to set one group against the other and to make them hate each other. We were taught the importance of getting large masses of people into the streets for marches and demonstrations. And finally, we were instructed into ways to take off riots and make them spread and to keep them going. This is all happening before us and is still un being unfolded right now as we speak in the United States. There's a black man in America, but he goes by the, the stage name of Lord Yamaha. His real name is Lorenzo Del Calis. He said back in 2016 that he was not a supporter of Black Lives Matter because he said it is not our movement. This is a movement that was given to us by, you know, George Soros and his boys. This Black Lives Matter is a social engineering of how a civil rights movement should move. It's political. The objective is not racial equality. It's for power and control through coercion and suppression of legitimate expressions of disagreement against their policies. George Soros has billions of dollars who he has invested in various left-wing Marxist causes to try to change American society. And young people tragically are the product of the educational system that's been in place for decades and decades across the Western world where they would prefer to live under socialism, Marxism, communism, but the irony is that they are agitating this in a free society that allows them freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of movement. But should such a revolution be implemented into living reality as it is in North Korea and in China, I dare say these people wouldn't thrive and wouldn't be happy to support such a cause. Words are one thing, actions are another. One of the leaders of this Black Lives Matter movement in New York, he says, we will burn down the system if necessary. The whole premise of Marxism is to destroy Western civilization and destroy the pillars that underpin this civilization. As we read in last June, in the presentation we gave, Jerry Kirk, who was himself an African-American, an operative of the FBI within these radical groups, 1966 to 1969, he said these people in these radical groups, as I dare say so many today in the various causes in America at this time, have no idea that they are playing into the hands of the establishment they claim to hate. The radicals think they're fighting the forces of the super rich like Rockefeller and Ford, 
and don't realize it is precisely such forces which are behind their own revolution, financing it and using it, notice, for their own purposes. The idea is to create a situation where the people are so frightened of the violence all around them that they will throw up their hands in the air and demand federal government do something. And the only choice open will be what? Martial law. The communists, black militants and revolutionaries will never succeed in overthrowing the government of the United States. But unless they are stopped, he said, they will scare the American people into accepting socialism from Washington and status rule by the insiders of the establishment. This is what it really is all about. That statement was made 50 years ago, and though we as Seventh Adventists should have nothing to do with politics, but the political contest in America now is coming down to this very line. Will the people accept open, blatant Marxism, socialism at the next election and allow themselves to be governed by such principles and status rule from the insiders of the establishment to total full control? Or will they step back from that brink of the precipice? Brethren and sisters, there are many forces, as we know from what we study, that are playing behind the scenes to bring America to the point where she will discard the last vestiges of Protestantism, of Protestant values, Protestant principles, and of liberty of conscience. We must not, of course, turn our eyes away from the evil, ugly reality of white racism in America at this time. This is another agency by which Satan is fermenting the waves and stirring the agitation. The blacks are legitimately grieved at the racism that's been portrayed against them by white supremacist groups. But of course, the situation is exploited to retaliate by using violence against the whole institutions of society. And Ella White feared even in her time, way back in 1907, that a race war would erupt in the United States. She feared the day when whites would wage war on blacks. She said in manuscript 196, 1907, I knew this very race war would be introduced. And America is about to step into that race war, which will degenerate into civil war and anarchy. We're that close to the total disintegration of Western society. Ellen White foretold in Education, page 228, what is to prevent our world from becoming a second Sodom? At the same time, notice anarchy seeking to sweep away all law, not only divine, not only God's law, but human. That's what's being portrayed today. That's what's being agitated. Defund the police force and so forth. Let us govern ourselves as the way we please. The centralizing of wealth and power, the vast combinations for the enriching of the few at the expense of the many, the combinations of the poor classes for the defense of their interests, the spirit of unrest, of riot and bloodshed, and notice the worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution. All are tending to involve how much? The whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. The reason why we're emphasizing so much on what's happening in America, because it is going to be replicated right around the world. What gives people the idea that they can do anything they want, regardless whether it's illegal, immoral, or unjust? And this is where spiritualism comes in, the teachings of spiritualism. Alistair Crowley, one of the most infamous Satanists of all time, he declared, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Thou hast no right but to do thy will. Isn't this the essence of every anti-God philosophy in this world today? Do as you please, do as you want. Anton LaVey from the Church of Satan, I don't like to quote these words, but this illustrates 
the, the dire teachings of spiritualism that has infested the whole world and has infiltrated the entertainment industry and has been propagated through the educational system in various ways. He said, when people join my church, they become more evil because they learn how to become evil, notice, in a more effective way. They've been trained, educated. Evil is just and right, he claimed. Evil, spelled backward, is live. And to us, this life represents Satanism. Brothers and sisters, we're told in the Review and Herald, April 14, 1896, that Satan will see in an apostate race his masterpiece of evil, men who reflect his own image. Evil, pure and simple. We are naturally wicked as we are. We don't need more encouragement. And quoting Satan himself in the Satanic Bible, I request reasons for your golden rule and ask the why and wherefore of your Ten Commandments. <clears throat> All this was quoted in the book written by René Norborgen, who interviewed La Anton LaVey in the late 1960s. In the book Prophet of Destiny, pages 159, 160, and 161, published in 1972. The principle of Satanism is to do as you please. A Satanist practices the motto, if a man smite me on one cheek, smash him on the other. Let no wrong go unredressed. I'm just sharing these examples to, sh to illustrate how vastly different the principles of Satan are to the principles of God's government and Satan wants to bring his principles as the ruling force across the entire planet. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We're naturally inclined towards evil. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. That's why Jesus says you must be born again. A new heart must be given to you. A new mind must be given to us. The mind of Christ. Education, page 227, 228. Spiritualism asserts that, and she's quoting from their own sources, each mind will judge itself that true knowledge places men above all law, accountable to no one, do as you please, that all sins are committed are innocent, sorry, all sins committed are innocent, for whatever is, is right, and God does not de condemn. It declares to all men, it matters not what you do, live as you please, heaven is your home. Multitudes are thus led to believe that desire is the highest law, that license is liberty, and that man is accountable only to himself. With such teaching given at the very outset of life, when impulse is strongest and the demand for self-restraint and purity is most urgent, where are the safeguards of virtue? What is to prevent the world from becoming a second Sodom? Very solemn thoughts, brethren and sisters. We know, as we've already mentioned, that the influence of these secret societies behind the scenes to engineer this final revolution just before Jesus comes, is being implemented, is been in place, has been established for decades, for centuries, financed with all the wealth that is at their disposal and aided with the most ingenuity and sophistication of mind. Winston Churchill, 100 years ago, said these words, from the days of Spartacus, Weishaupt, the founder of the Illuminati on May the 1st, 1776, to those of Karl Marx, to those of Trotsky, this worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization, <clears throat> excuse me, and for the reconstruction of society on the basis of arrested development and envious malevolence and impossible equality has been steadily growing. It has been the mainspring of every subversive movement during the 19th century. And now at last, this band of extraordinary personalities 
from the underworld of the great cities of Europe and America have gripped the Russian people by the hair of their heads and have become the undisputed masters of that enormous empire. Do we need to digress to calculate how many millions of people lost their lives under this system, under this tyranny? And this is to be replicated again on a world wide scale. It need not go by the name of communism in the Western world. It just needs the same principles being inculcated under the new world order system. <clears throat> Jean Pierre Louis de Luquette, a French journalist during the time of the revolution, just before it broke out in 1789 in France, said these words, deluded people, you must understand that there exists a conspiracy in favor of despotism and against liberty, of incapacity against talent, of vice against virtue, of ignorance against light. Every half-baked idea, every invention serves to fit the doctrines of the Illuminati. The aim is what? Universal domination. And we know who Adam Weishaupt was, wasn't he? He was a Jesuit priest. And so we see the Jesuits have had their finger in the pie with these secret societies <clears throat> confederating together, working about to bring a new regime on the world scene. And this is why we're told in manuscript 132, 1902, this terrible picture drawn by John, and she's quoted Revelation 18, one to six, to show how completely the powers of earth will give themselves over to evil should show those <clears throat> who have received the truth how dangerous it is to link up with secret societies or to join themselves in any way with those who do not keep God's commandments. Reminds me of 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 6 verses 14 to 18. What union have light with darkness? One concord with Christ with Belial. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. <clears throat> Great Controversy, page 276, 277, 1911 edition. It was popery that had begun the work which atheism was completing in France. And the same thing today in our modern world as Catholicism has been working for centuries to destroy the Protestant movement, the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant values, and the Protestant principles, which when they were established in those countries in the West, like Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom, and the United States, made them great, thriving, prosperous nations. The policy of Rome had brought out those conditions. Notice, social, political, and religious, that were hurrying France into ruin. Popery had poisoned the minds of kings against the Reformation as an enemy to the crown, an element of discord that would be fatal to the peace and harmony of the nation. It was the genius of Rome, the subtlety of Rome, if you please, that by this means inspired the direst cruelty and the most galling oppression that proceeded from the throne. Same book, page 265, the war against the Bible, carried forward for so many centuries in France, culminated in the scenes of the revolution. That terrible outbreaking was but the legitimate result of Rome's suppression of the scriptures. How is this being repeated and replicated in our day today when we have the Bibles available everywhere in our society? where well, Rome is still working to destroy the authority of the scriptures. One mode of attack is higher criticism. Two Dutch scholars are credited with starting the higher criticism method of scrutinizing the Bible, Erasmus and Espinoza, but it was really in Germany's Tübingen School of Theology in the 18th century that popularized this method of critiquing the Bible and furthered its spread throughout the Western world. There at the heart of the Reformation in Germany, where Luther made his declaration, here I stand, 
may God help me, was where Satan instituted this devious device to undermine the authority and the confidence in the scriptures. And that was further supported by the papacy. And this has come to the point and it is replicated in the theological schools and it's been manifested in Adventism today where there is a disbelief in the very basic doctrines of scripture. Way back in 1970, Claude Thompson said this from the United Theological Seminary, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Chandler School of Theology in America. We should take a new look at theological seminaries. They may be doing more harm than good. What can we expect from our pupils, it should say, when, or what can we expect from our pulpits, that's correct there, when men are trained under teachers who profess no faith in God, who doubt his existence, who regard Jesus as only a good man, not a savior, who have no place for prayer, who minimize the authority of the Bible, who've dismissed any idea, <coughs> excuse me, of spiritually transformed lives under the Holy Spirit, who do not believe in life after death, and who have long since come to regard our Wesleyan heritage, both theologically and evangelically, as out of date. Again, the same method of undermining the principles of God's law has been brought into the theological institutions, especially in the classrooms of those students who will become ministers and teach the same heresy to their members in the pulpits of their churches. This has been seen in Adventism today. This is Satan's strategy with this mode of education to prevent the replication of God's character in the image of man. Another mode of attack instituted by the papacy and the Jesuits, of course, is the modern Bible versions. Let me read to you, as I've read countless times over the years, Rome's official attitude toward the Bible. This is very important as we see this unholy confederacy working together to destroy and try to destroy Western civilization in its war against biblical Christianity, in its war against the last remnants of Protestantism as a movement in the world today. Great is our reverence for the Bible, <clears throat> excuse me, Reason and experience compel us to say that it alone is not a competent nor a safe guide for us to follow today. A competent guide for the Christian religion must possess these three qualifications. One, it must be within the reach of every inquirer after truth. Two, it must be clear and intelligible to all. Three, it must possess all the truths of the Christian religion. The Bible, however, possesses none of these qualifications. You'll see there, this was written by a Jesuit priest, John O'Brien, published way back in the year 1950. The Church of Rome has always exalted traditions and the decretals of the papacy above the word of God, and human society elevates its own foolishness above the wisdom of God's eternal truth. A writer way back in 1854, G.B. Nicolini said, I cannot too much impress upon the minds of my readers that the Jesuits, by their very calling, by the very essence of their institution, are bound to seek by every means, right or wrong, the destruction of Protestantism. This is the condition of their existence, the duty they must fulfill or cease to be Jesuits. Brethren and sisters, as we will see in the next presentation, when we fraternize with the enemy because we're ignorant of his devices, we're caught in the trap and we're lured into the same antagonism against the veritable truths of God's word. Dr. Alberto Rivera said Ignatius de Loyola set out to accomplish in the establishment of the Jesuit order, a universal church and the end of Protestantism. And what was the basis of Protestantism? The Bible and the Bible alone. 
Percy T. McGann on your left there, Edward Sutherland in the center of your picture, were two of the seven co-founders of Madison College. Ellen White was another co-founder and this was the only institution in which she was aboard of that college. This is what Edward Sutherland said in his classic book, Studies on Christian Education, which first came out in 1915. The Church of Rome, since its rejuvenation from the time of the Counter-Reformation, is literally alive with determined, enthusiastic, zealous soldiers who know nothing but to live, to be spent, and to die for the church. She is determined to conquer and bring back humiliated, broken down, and completely subjugated the Protestant denominations. She has everywhere, through her Jesuit teachers, editors, and public officials, men at work to fashion public sentiment to capture the important and controlling positions of government and, most of all, to obtain control through her teachers of what? The minds of Protestant children and youth. Rome knew that to destroy the Reformation, she must conquer the educational system, and she's done it. To the point that way back in 1930, this Jesuit priest F. X. Talbot in the Jesuit magazine America said this, the old Protestant culture is about at the end of the rope, even back then. Why can't we make the US Catholic in legislation, Catholic in justice, aims, and ideals? Do we see, brethren and sisters, in this presentation how far this war has been waged against Western civilization? But there's one more factor as we come to a close. One more factor we need to cover that has really done more to destroy Western civilization than any of the points we have covered thus far, vitally important though they have been. One more factor, and this will be carried over into our next presentation. Let me read to you from the Signs of the Times, February 25, 1897. But the doctrine is now largely taught that the gospel of Christ has made the law of God of no effect, that by believing we are released from the necessity of being doers of the word. But this is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Christ so unsparingly condemned. This teaching, brethren and sisters, has destroyed the power of the church. The teaching that the law of God is no longer effect. We're no longer obligated to keep the law. We can't even keep the law, even with the power of God. Have you heard that? Does that sound familiar to you? The doctrine of the Nicolaitans has infiltrated the church, has infiltrated society, and is destroying the very foundations of Western civilization. Notice this powerful statement, Great Controversy 404, 1884 edition. Upon those religious leaders whose teachings have opened the door to infidelity, atheism, if you please, Marxism. Marx himself was a Christian at one time. He professed to be a Christian. He abandoned it. Upon those teach teachings, let me read again. Upon those religious leaders whose teachings have opened the door to infidelity, to spiritualism, and to contempt for God's holy law, as expressed in apostate Christendom, rests a fearful responsibility for the iniquity that exists in the Christian world. And the irony is that these leaders would then urge that we need to come back to God and we need to come back through the keeping of Sunday. That's the irony. So in conclusion, we read these words as we wrap up this presentation. The people of God are not to be guided by the opinions or practices of the world. The professed Protestant world will form a confederacy, a conspiracy, if you please, with the man of sin. And the church and the world will be in corrupt harmony because so many rank themselves under the banner of the Prince of Darkness, 
Will God's commandment keeping people swerve from their allegiance? Never. Not one who is abiding in Christ will fail or fall. Praise God, brethren and sisters. On whose side shall we choose to stand? If you're in hell December 4, 1900, Christ speaks of the church over which Satan presides as the synagogue of Satan. Its members are the children of disobedience. They are those who choose to sin, who labor to make void the law of God. It is Satan's work to mingle evil with good and to remove the distinction between good and evil. Christ would have a church that labors to separate the evil from the good, whose members will not willingly tolerate wrongdoing, but will expel it from the heart and life. Yes, God will have a people and pray that we will be amongst that number that will pray and cry out to God. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Brothers and sisters, we are living in very solemn times. May God help us to awake to the hour in which we live, because the coming of Christ is nigh at hand. I invite you to kneel with me as we close this meeting. We'll have a break for about 10 minutes and then we'll come back for our second presentation. <laughs> Gracious, kind, heavenly fathers, we bow before thee. I pray that our hearts may be stirred to realize the magnitude and the extent of the developments that are taking place in this world in apostate Christendom today to make void the law of God the principles of your government and to prevent the replication of your beautiful character in the hearts of humanity. Oh, help us to see, dear Father, that Satan has a thousand satanic battles that he's waging against God's people at this time to cause us, even the very elect, to be deceived if possible. But we praise God that you will have a people who will not conform, who will not bow down, who will not yield, who will not compromise, who will not surrender to this philosophy that makes void the principles of God's government. Help us, dear Father, to treasure the truth that we have. Help us to be Protestants in the true sense of the word, the Bible and the Bibles to be the basis of our beliefs, practices, and faith, that we will at the same time allow liberty of conscience, freedom of speech, and allow people the freedom that you have given them to exercise their God-given rights to decide one way or the other whether they'll serve you or serve Baal. Oh Lord, as we will come to the next session and bring this closer home to us as Seventh-day Adventists, I pray that you will stir an awakening in the hearts of your people. We may be ready for the coming of Christ. We may be the vessels through whom you can communicate the light of truth to this world that the world may be lightened with the glory of the message of salvation and that the love of Jesus, the meekness of Jesus, the character of Jesus will shine in our hearts that we will not do, as Satan says, smash people on the other cheek if they despise us, but we will pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Bless us as we go into the break and may our minds and hearts be prepared for the next presentation. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.